first thing that's obvious in that question is that you have to find the angular velocity, right? Angular velocity, you're given the diameter from which you can find the radius, but the frequency is given in the wrong units because it cannot be rotations per minute. It has to be rotations per second. So that's what you do first. And to change rotations per minute into rotations per second, you got to divide by 60. So that will give you the frequency. And then you have angular velocity as 2 pi times the linear frequency. That's the formula you're going to use. Angular velocity is 2 pi times the frequency. In this case, the frequency is 2,500 divided by 60. You get it in rotations per second. So plug in that number, and you will get the angular velocity. Uh, it's 261.8 radians per second. That's the unit of angular speed, isn't it? Radians per second. And then you look at the B part. What are the linear speeds and acceleration of a point on the edge of the grinding beam? Now you're asked to find the linear speed. So you have to know the relation between angular speed and linear speed. Do you know that relation? We talked about all this. And the relation is linear speed is angular speed multiplied by radius. Now, since you have the angular speed multiplied with the radius, again, that's half of the diameter, so you get 46 meter per second. And then you're asked to find the radial acceleration. Does anybody know the equation for radial acceleration? Huh? V squared over the radius, yes. Radial acceleration is also called, did you say radius or did you say something? <laughs> radial acceleration is also called? Centripetal. Centripetal acceleration. So it's V squared over R. So substitute there. Or omega squared times R. There are two formulas, either V squared over R or omega squared times the radius. Substitute that, and you will, you will get the answer. 1.2 times 10 to the 4 meter per second, meter per second squared. How do we define angular acceleration? How do we define linear acceleration? Yeah, it's always it's change in velocity divided by change in time. Change in angular velocity divided by change in time. So alpha is change in angular velocity divided by change in time. Aren't you given the time? Yes, you're given the time as four seconds. And you see that the frequency is going up from 130 to 280. Each one of those will give you the omega, wouldn't it? First, you'll have to change it into rotations per second. Multiply by 2 pi, each one, and that'll give you omega 1. That'll give you omega 2. The difference will give you the change. Divided by the time will give you alpha. That's the plan. Okay. Okay. Omega naught, initial angular velocity, is 2 pi times the initial frequency, which is 2 pi times 130 divided by 60, again, because it's in minutes. we got to change it into rotations per second. That gives 13.6 radians per second. The final angular velocity, again, the same way, 2 pi times the frequency gives 29.3 radian per second.
Well, you can directly write the equation as change divided by time, but I'm just showing that equation. Change divided by time. Take the difference. Divided by four seconds. 3.9 radian per second squared. So that gives you time to think about the second part. Now, in the last problem, we already found the radial acceleration. I told you it's also called centripetal acceleration, isn't it? Therefore, you know the formula. It's omega squared times the radius. But the thing is, you have to find it two seconds after it is accelerating. Did you notice that? So you cannot, can you use this omega? No, that's the omega after four seconds. So you'll have to find the new omega after two seconds, and then omega squared times the radius will give you the radial acceleration. Okay. So in the B part, so that's why I'm specifically writing it's after two seconds. Find the omega using that formula. Of course, omega naught is 13.6, because that's what it started with, plus 3.9 times 2. Once you get that, the radial acceleration is omega squared r. So tangential acceleration, alpha times r, because I showed you how you get it. You know alpha? We already got the value of alpha here. And you know the radius. Just multiply, you get 1.4 meter per second squared. When you read that, clearly, the fan is rotating, and rotating really fast, right? And you have just switched it off. And we know that as soon as you switch it off, it will not come to a stop. And it turns 1,500 times before it comes to a stop. What was the fan's angular acceleration, assuming that it's constant? So think about the terms that we know. Do we know the initial angular velocity? Or do we at least know how to find it? Yes, because we know the initial frequency. So that's the plan. If you divide this by 60, you are going to get the frequency, isn't it? Multiply that with 2 pi, that will give you the initial angular velocity. And what's the final angular velocity? Zero, because it stopped. And is this the time? What is this? What? What is the use of that quantity? I mean, what is that going to give you? Radius. Radius. It turned 1,500 times before it stopped. So what is that going to give you? No. No. What does that 1,500 give you is what I want. That's why this problem is important. The change in theta. Right. Because you know that each time it rotates, it goes through how many radians? Two pi radians. So if it rotates 1,500 times, the total angle made is 1,500 times 2 pi. So now you've got omega 1, you've got omega 2, you've got the initial and the final, you have the time, and you have theta. Do you know a relation connecting those four? Do you know a relation connecting omega naught, omega f, or omega alpha is what you're asked to find, isn't it? 
and theta, or delta theta. Do you know the relation? And that will, relation would be? Omega f squared is equal to omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta, which corresponds to b f squared is b naught squared plus 2 a delta a. It's a corresponding relation. So now it's only math. Omega naught is 2 pi times frequency, which is 2 pi times 850 divided by 60. I got 89 radians per second. You should have got that. Okay. And then final is zero. Total angle covered is 1,500 times 2 pi. Delta theta or theta is the total angle, which is 1,500 times 2 pi, because in each rotation, the angle is 2 pi. That's the important point. You get minus because it's slowing down. It's actually a deceleration in radians per second squared. And then the second part, you should be, you should go ahead of me. How long did it take for the fan to a complete, come to a complete stop? So now you're looking for time. And that must be easy. Don't you know a corresponding relation to find time? You could use any of the equations. This is the one that I've used. The idea is displacement is average angular velocity multiplied by time. We have used that, haven't we? Displacement is average angular velocity multiplied by time. I've taken the average of these two. The mean. You take the mean of two by adding them, dividing by two. So, Or you can use any other formula. You will get the same. You could have used this. You would get the same answer. Because now you know alpha. 211.79 seconds. It takes a long time for that fan to stop. And you know that fans don't stop quickly. They keep on. If the bearing is good, if the friction is less, it takes a long, long time for it to stop. Have you noticed that? When it gets older, well, creaking noises, more friction, wastage of power, and music to the ears as we sleep. Free music. We get everything. You have the initial linear speed in wrong units. Did you notice that? cannot be in kilometers per hour. It has to be in meter per second. So you'll have to change that into meter per second. How? Multiply by 5, divide by 18. So 95 times 5 by 18, and then 45 times 5 by 18, that will give you the linear speed. Using the linear speed, you can find the angular speed. We've done that like a couple of times today. Is that the relation? So now you can find the omega from the linear speed and the radius, and then find the change. 65 revolutions. Doesn't that give you 65 times 2 pi as the total angle? So it's the same problem. Thought you need more practice, that's all. 95 kilometers per hour. 95 times 5 by 18 gives you... 26.39 meter per second. 
that's V naught. So that is omega naught is going to be that times the radius. I'm sorry, divided by the radius, because linear velocity is omega times radius, isn't it? So this will be divided by 0.4. And so many people forget, you know, what's given is not the radius. Saw that a number of times on the exam. That's not the radius. So you get that. And then do the same thing for the final velocity. from which you again find the final angular velocity. I have slowed it down to writing pace. I hope you notice that. So once you get the initial angular velocity and the final angular velocity, you're looking for alpha. It's initial and the final. Alpha is this time I'm going to use the one that we used in the last problem, isn't it? Omega squared minus omega naught squared by 2 theta. Because we know that uh, the angle in one rotation is 2 pi. So 2 times, 65 times 2 pi. And you get, again, negative because it's slowing down. And the B part, how much more time is required for it to stop? Would you be able to do that? If it's continuing with the same deceleration, how much more time? Well, now we know the final velocity is zero, isn't it? Final angular velocity is zero, so... Omega is omega naught plus alpha t. Make time the subject. So all these problems up to this stage are just kinematics. But the scenario is going to change now, quickly. Because we have not used rotational inertia, nothing, right? This is just all kinematic problems so far. I got 7.6 seconds. Did anybody get that before I did? Where did I get that from? You know, I like to put it as meter newton because remember, torque is R cross F, not F cross R. Remember that R cross F is not the same as F cross R. I'm going to give you the reason as I'm talking. Uh, isn't, isn't torque a vector too? I forgot to put this. It's a vector. So it should have a direction. And this is how you find the direction. I've told you about finding the direction for angular velocity, didn't I? Right-hand rule, same thing. So if the rotation is clockwise, isn't that clockwise for you? Is it clockwise for you? <laughs> counterclockwise for you, right? So if that is counterclockwise, so something is rotating that way, hold your fingers of the right hand in the direction of rotation. The thumb gives you the direction of the torque. So the thumb is out, isn't it? So if it's a disc rotating here, that's serious. Look at that. Actually, it's rotating this way, right? But what's the direction of the torque and the angular velocity? Out of the plane of the board, perpendicular to it. But what if it is rotating in the opposite direction? Into the plane of the board, again perpendicular to it. So torque is always perpendicular to the plane containing radius and the force. That's the important thing. It's always perpendicular. Okay, do that. How do you do it? You are using a wrench that is 28 centimeters long. What force perpendicular to the wrench must the mechanic exert at its end? Just find the first part. And that's direct. 
tau is given, the radius is given, you have to find the force, okay? I don't think you should take more time than that. Isn't that maximum now? Because tau is out of sine theta, and theta is given as 90 degrees. So if theta is 90 degrees, sine 90 is 1. Point two eight because it has to be in meters, 310 newtons. That is the force that the mechanic has to apply. Have you at least one time in your life thought about why some bolts have four sides, some have six sides, some may have eight sides? Have you thought about it? That's what the second part of the problem is going to tell you. The advantage of having six sides, you know what I'm talking about, right? The bolt head having six sides, hexagonal or octagonal, or you know. Why? We're going to find out in the second part. So look at the second part. In the second part, it says the six-sided, in this case, six-sided, bolt head is 15 millimeters in diameter. It's small, isn't it? 15 millimeters. Estimate the force applied near each end of the six points. So the mechanic is actually applying 310 newtons. That's clear. But now you're going to see the effective force acting on the head of the bolt. Because this 310 newtons is not enough to tighten the bolt on a cylinder head. That's the most important part of the engine, the cylinder head. It has to be really tight. So how do we do that? Okay. So it's a real practical question. There are six sides. The number of sides is important. Six sides, therefore there are six points where the force will act. So F is tau by six times. What, are the, what is that? What is that? 15 millimeters, half of that gives you the radius, which is 7.5 millimeters, isn't it? And changed into meters. 7.5 millimeters in meters. And it gives you... 2,000 newtons. Hmm. Which is as 310 <coughs> multiplied by 6. So the mechanic is only applying 310, but the effective force that's tightening it is 2,000 newtons. In this case, I is MR squared because it's a point mass. 0.650 is the mass, 1.2 is the radius. Hmm. Well, the B part says, what's the torque needed to keep the ball rotating at constant angular velocity if air resistance exerts a force of 0 0.020 newtons on the ball? Somebody tell me. Air resistance applies that much force, so don't you have to apply at least that much to keep it rotating with a constant velocity? Okay, so we know the force that we're going to apply. It's 0 0.020. We know the radius. So calculation of the torque is easy. That's what I told you, the torque needed is the same as that caused by friction. Therefore, you apply. That is net tau is zero. Isn't that net is zero because it's equal and opposite? When the net is zero, that's when the acceleration is zero. Therefore, the angular velocity is constant. Made that a long story. Simple to know that the applied torque is the same as due to friction. Multiply it with the radius, and you have your answer. The unit is, again, meter newton. Grinding wheel is a uniform cylinder. Is that the same as a disk? 
But I think a cylinder is a thick disk. What do you say? Is a cylinder a very thick disk? Come on. And look at the rotational inertia for a disk. Does it involve the thickness? No? But yes. What am I saying? Yes. The mass already contains its thickness, doesn't it? If it's thicker, then the mass will be greater. Come on. So although you don't see the thickness, it's there in the form of mass. So for a cylinder, this will be the same formula is what I'm trying to tell you. Because a cylinder is nothing but a thick disk. You got that? As long as the cylinder is rotating about this axis. See that? The axis is important. It should be passing through the center. Then the formula is mr squared. So now you know its moment of inertia. So moment of inertia of a cylinder is just one half mr squared. Mass is given. Radius is given in centimeters. You have to change it into meters. And you would get, remember that usually moment of inertia will be really small quantities, okay? Which you can see here is times 10 to the negative 3 kilogram meter squared. All right, the B part says how much torque is needed to accelerate it from rest to 1,500 RPM in 5 seconds if it is known to slow down from 1,500 RPM to rest in 55 seconds. Man, I like this part of the problem, so I'll give you more time. Uh, it's known to slow down from 1,500 to rest in 55 seconds. So somebody tell me what to do now. What do I do? How I find the friction. How do I find the friction? This is rotation. Oh, yeah, convert to the rotational. Okay, so what is that? What is the rotational thing of F is equal to ma? Isn't this the thing? When here, here it is. Yeah. Okay. So what are you telling me? You're telling me use this? Yeah. The torque is the force of friction. Oh, the torque is the torque due to friction. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you're on the right track. I'm trying to help you. Come on. So, what? Make it clear. And you find the angular acceleration. Oh, you mean to say, use the second part, find yeah. the angular acceleration yeah. due to friction. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Because the initial is 1,500, we don't subtract and the final is 0, isn't it? 1,500 and 0? Time is 55. 1,500, it goes to 0. Mm -hmm. So from this, can't you find the initial? This is the final. Yeah. Okay. And then, aren't you given the time? Yeah. That will give you the alpha. Mm -hmm. And I is still the same. So you would find that torque due to friction. Agreed? So once you get that number, let's say it is 1,000, I don't know. Once you get 1,000, you find the actual torque required like we did last time. And you got to? Subtract. Or add. The question is, how much torque has to be applied? If friction is 1,000, you add it because you have to apply over and above that. Agreed? Let's say that when you calculate this, you get 2,000. I'm just throwing in some numbers. You get 2,000. That's all you had to apply if there was no frictional torque. But there is 1,000. So you'll have to apply 3,000 to get the effect of 2,000. You got it? Okay, let's do it. It's the same object. The moment of inertia is the same. The moment of inertia depends only on the object. It doesn't matter whether it's friction or... You got it? Yeah. It's the same object. Yeah, so what I did here is the torque due to friction, that is tau fr, is equal to I alpha due to friction. 
and that's I just put it as delta omega by delta t, which you know is the same as omega minus omega naught. See, so uh, substitute that, and then I remembered that I had to find omega naught, so I'm going about it, and I'm substituting the omega naught because omega is zero. I got minus 5.98 times 10 to the negative 3. And then I'm telling you, like I explained, that the net torque should be the sum of both the applied in this. Don't be, don't be worried when you see that subtraction because two negatives make a positive, okay? Why, why is it negative? Yeah, two, because it's an opposing torque. Friction always opposes, right? That's why. That's why I said, in effect, it will become positive, right? Because it's two negatives, so in effect, it will become positive. So actually, you have to apply 72 times 10 to the negative 3 meter newton. 72 times 10 to the negative 3. OK, remember that uh, it's only time for concepts now, so I'll, I might have to move this forward. Number 9. This is the same type of problem. A helicopter rotor blade can be considered a long, thin rod. Do we know the rotational inertia for a rod? Come on. Do we know the formula for rotational inertia of a rod? Uh, it's a very thin cylinder, so the formula changes to. Uh, I guess it involves like the area of the cylinder or something. Volume. No, we we actually talked about this the other day. I gave you the formula, or maybe this. I don't know, slipped out of your minds. ML squared by twelve. That is the formula for rotational inertia of a rod. But if it's rotating about the center, if it's rotating about the center, then that's a form. Think about a helicopter, the blades, are they rotating about their centers? Where are they rotating? The ends. So you'll have to use the parallel axis theorem, remember that? To find the rotational inertia at this point. How do you do that? That would be Mel squared by 12 plus the mass of the rod times the distance. What's the distance between these two axes? Half. Half, okay. Square of that. So that will give you ML squared by 12 plus ML squared by 4, which is going to be somebody. Come on. This would be 4 ml squared by 12, which is ml squared by 3. Because it's rotating about one end, the rotational inertia is ml squared by 3 in this case. And how many do you have in this problem? 3. So you'll have to find the rotational inertia of each one, multiply by 3. Again, I'm explaining that is the rotational inertia about the center of gravity. You see that? The, but this is the rotational inertia when the axis is at one end. I'm proving it again. It's ml squared by 3. Now, total, there are 3, so multiply with 3. The 3s get canceled. Mass is 160. The radius is the length, of course. Isn't it? 3.75. And you get 2250 kilogram meter squared. So that's the first part. What's the second part? Come on. I cannot help you if you have shut yourself out of the class. 
How much torque must the motor apply to bring the blades up to a speed of five revolutions per second in eight seconds? Come on, we did that how many? Like five times now. What's the initial angular velocity? And we have the final frequency from which you find the final angular velocity. Tau is again I alpha. That will be the sixth time we are using that formula. Alpha is final angular velocity, which is 2 pi times the frequency, minus 0, divided by the time. Multiply that with 2250, and you get the torque. Which brings us to the tenth question. And when you look at the tenth question, we already did it. Let's see whether you'll recognize. Didn't we find the total kinetic energy of a coin that's going down? Yes. What's the difference between that problem and this? Tell me the difference between... What's the sphere? That's it. So, so it will also have two kinetic energies. Add them up, right? And we use the rotational inertia of a sphere. What's the formula for rotational inertia of a sphere? 2 by 5. I know I've not told you this. You have to know it. So basically, you have to know at least five formulas. Rotational inertia of an object, mr squared. Rotational inertia of a disk, mr squared by 2. Rotational inertia of a rod, ml squared by 12, right? Rotational inertia of a sphere, solid sphere, 2 by 5 mr squared. Last, rotational inertia of a hollow sphere. Wait, tell me which one would be greater, of a solid sphere or a hollow sphere, if both have the same mass? One is a solid sphere, the other is a hollow sphere, but both have the same mass, which means they're made of different materials, okay? So which one will have a greater rotational inertia? because the ma more mass is distributed away from its axis, therefore the formula will be 2 by 3 mr squared. Hold on. All the one, solid. OK. What is this? What did you say uh, the one was by 12? ml squared by 12. That's right here. Rod. Oh, rod. Is this a solid one, or is it a hollow one? Solid. OK. So find its total. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is made up of two parts, isn't it? What are they? Translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. So, translational is one half mass times velocity squared, rotational is one half I omega squared. So, the rest is easily understandable. It's math. Simple substitutions. And we did this one time, so we did it for a disk. Now we're doing it for a sphere. Finally, you get 7 by 10 mv squared. So mass is 7.3 velocity. Do you realize that we don't even need the radius? We don't need the radius. 3.3. Okay, 3. 55.65 joules is the answer. Come on. Is it rotating only, or is it rotating and also moving forward? Some are looking at it's moving forward by looking at the tip, I think. But let me tell you that it's not moving forward. It's only rotating in this case because specifically it says, and its lower end does not slip. So its lower end does not slip. So it's like only rotation. It's only rotation. One, your idea was great. Potential energy is equal to rotational kinetic energy. Agreed? Okay. What's the formula? MGH is equal to what? One half I omega squared. But that's not the end of the problem because you still have. Huh? 
Before and after. Before and after. Well, it's just rotating. So, okay, what's the I? It'll be ML squared over 12. Over 3. Over 3, because it's rotating about one end. Okay. Over 3. Ah, yes. Isn't it? It's rotating about one end. And aren't we asked to find the speed? Is that the angular speed? Does it sound like the angular speed or linear speed? Linear, linear speed. So, v squared by r squared. Omega is v divided by r. Agree? Because we're looking for the linear speed. Okay, on the side you have what? Mg? H. Did they give you the mass? Yeah. Oh, they gave you the mass? No. no, no well, I, I'm blinded. It cancels, out. <laughs> it cancels out. That's why you don't need the mass. Oh, the length and the radius are the same, isn't it? Oh, wow. So that's why I like this problem, because there's less math in it, there's more physics in it. Right? And so you have moved forward so fast, leaving me behind, so you get the six. GH, and so you're going to say v squared is 6GH, and I'm going to say it's wrong. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> so now you have to think about why did I get with you up to this stage, and then after this I cancel it out? I mean, I was with you up to this point, right? So that means that's right. But then I just... I know that's what you're going to do. You, you're just going to do that. I know that. Oh, what's the height? What's the height? Is there a radius? Or you will take the height as the length, isn't it? Yeah. That's where you went wrong. The length is, is it the length of the, the circumference or the arc length? Don't think those ways right. Everybody think about the height. If you were possibly going to put the height as 2.3, that's where you were going to go wrong. So I tried to save you. Think now. That's why I said one out of a hundred students get it. Because of that thing. And I'm so glad that Juan got this idea, which is one out of 20 students get that. Now this one is one out of a hundred to correct that. Who can tell me why the height is not the length of the rod? This is what makes the subject what it is. Yes. Thank you so much, because if you have a mass that's uniformly spread out, you cannot imagine that the mass is at the top. The only thing you can do is that the mass is situated at the center. Therefore, your height here would be length by two. Thank you. That's what makes physics good. So it's MGH is equal to one-half I omega squared. And you can write there, you can see that already H is L by 2. I'm sure everybody understood that, right? You cannot assume that its mass is at the top. Can you tell me exactly why again? I mean, I get it, but why is The mass is assumed to be at the center of an object. That's called the center of gravity, right? right. So if you have the rod, the mass has to be imagined to be at its center which is half its length. Okay. That's the so what does that have to do with the length? It's half the length. The height is half the length. Because the tensile energy is your solid object based, is based off where the mass is. Ah, gotcha. Where the top of the object is. Gotcha. Okay. So you get 8.22 meter per second. Otherwise, you would have got 16 point. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay. So you would all agree that this was a good question because you had... Now, wouldn't you love to have 10 questions like this on the exam with no math at all? That would be the real physics exam. But right now, I'm in no position to do that, and you know why. <laughs> but one day, I will do it. That will be the day when the exam is about physics. Well, in this first question, a child rolls a ball on a level floor 3.5 meters to another child. 
If the ball makes 15 revolutions, what is its diameter? We know that uh, the circumference of a ball as it rolls is 2 pi times its radius. So for each rotation, it will move through a distance of 2 pi times its radius. And this question says it makes 15 revolutions. And in doing so, it moves over 3.5 meters. Therefore, all it got to do is its circumference uh, multiplied by 15 should give you 3.5. So the ball rolls a distance of 2 pi r with each revolution, and therefore, in 15 revolutions, the total distance moved would be 15 times 2 pi r, which is equal to 3.5, from which we can find the radius as 3.5 divided by 15 times 2 pi, which gives 3.7 times 10 to the negative 2 meter. And therefore, the diameter is twice that, 7.4 times 10 to the negative 2 meter. Now, in question 11, a sphere of radius 20 centimeter and mass 1.80 kilogram starts from rest and rolls without slipping down a 30 degree incline that is 10 meter long. Calculate its translational and rotational speeds when it reaches the bottom. Well, we do them one by one. Uh, first one, you got to calculate its translational and rotational speeds. Okay, so that's the incline. Uh, the sphere is rolling down, it's 30 degrees, 10 meters. Now from this right angle triangle, we know that, you know, this is the opposite side, so H is 10 sine 30, which gives you five meter. And at the top, it has potential energy, which is MGH. And as it comes rolling down, the potential energy at this point is converted into two types of kinetic energy. First, rotational kinetic energy. Second, translational kinetic energy. So by the principle of conservation of energy, the potential energy at the top is equal to the sum of the two kinetic energies at the bottom. For a sphere, uh, we can prove by substituting the value of rotational inertia as 2 by 5 mr squared and omega as v by the radius and simplifying. Again, let me say that moment of inertia is 2 by 5 mr squared and omega is v by r. And when you add them up, you will get 7 by 10 mv squared. Now from that, you can find the velocity as square root 10 by 7 gh, which is 10 times 9.8 times 5 by 7 gives 8.36 meter per second. And then omega is v by r, so you get 8.36 by 0.2 which is 41.8 radians per second. So we have the linear speed and the angular speed, both the linear and the angular. Okay.